Hi, I'm Bandi Verma, and I'm going to talk about MXEC. Uh, it stands for Multi Mission Execution, which is an autonomous. Uh, we developed this as a prototype for the Europa mission for autonomous science restart um, for this mission. So I'll talk a little bit more about it. So there were a few of us who worked on the development, and we also had uh, you know, someone work on a ground interface for this a prototype. Uh, let me, I'm just, there we go. So the Europa uh, mission is, they, they are, first of all, it's gonna take a whole bunch of time to get to Europa, and there are 45 flybys that the mission is baseline to perform. And, you know, this is the ITAR safe version of this picture. So, you know, there's Jupiter and there's Europa and there are these 45 uh, flybys. That's all you get after going all this way. And each of the flybys is 10 to 20 hours. So this is the segment, which is the flyby, and it's just 10 to 20 hours. The whole pedal is about 14 days. And the requirement, and I think uh, Steve mentioned this in his talk previously too, um, you know, we've uh, operated on Mars where uh, there is some radiation, but the radiation out here in Europa is just so much higher that the expectation is that we'll have up to five flight software resets during just that segment of the flyby. And the highest priority science is actually occurring during that time. So you go all the way, they take decades to develop this instrument for this critical science, and the desire is to recover that science. So if the spacecraft resets, they want to actually determine what the state is and recover that sign. So that was the motivation behind a lot of this work. And as Dan was mentioning, a lot of us have worked on rover missions and as they're getting so capable, we are also realizing that the utilization is not limited by the software on board, but by what, how we can uh, validate the plans that we send to the spacecraft. So, these, these tie in together and that is why there was a multi-mission aspect of this, is that we wanted to solve this problem, uh, which is for, uh, you know, failing operational, but also keeping in mind that there are all these other things that uh, you can get from a similar system. Moving forward, oh, there we go. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the motivation and some of you may be familiar with this, but in general, this is how, uh, one of the goals for what we were doing was to make it, uh, to demonstrate that for a mission that is going to, that's already in the development phase, we could actually get this technology on the existing platform so that it would seamlessly integrate with how we operate these uh, spacecraft. So going through some of how we do um, the planning these days. So this is what we call the sequencing approach, which is what we use on most, or pretty much all the spacecraft at JPL in different forms. What happens first is we start on the ground and there is some intent and constraints that we have on the ground. So this planning is occurring uh, on the ground here. And for this example, I am showing that there are, the, I'm calling these uh, tasks, but in different missions they call them activities. And what you want to do here is the main goal is that they would, and I am trying to click forward. Maybe I should be doing it here. There. Um, so one of the instruments on board Europa is the UVIS instrument, and the uh, and the plan is to uh, the, the desire is to scan as we are flying by across Europa. When to do a UVIS scan, the activity to do a scan has some constraints, which is that you need to um, actually I clicked too far. Sorry about this. There we go. So the to do the scan, you the instrument needs to be maintained at a certain temperature, but in order to maintain that temperature, you first have to warm it uh, to, uh, to the desired temperature. So there are these constraints between these activities, and on the ground, we have models which allow us to know that in order to get to this temperature, because, uh, which is based on the predicted state, how much earlier do we need to start the warm up. There are also constraints with uh, GNC, which is that in order to do this scan, we need to actually slew across the face of Europa. In order to do that correctly, we want to first attain the attitude we need to get at and then do the slew. So there are all these constraints with these activities that we model on the ground. And uh, once we've done that, we have uh, these tools that you can use the predicted state and model them. But in the end, once we are done with all that, we create a sequence which contains one 
or sometimes, such as on the surface missions where we use some conditional logic, it may be a few possible paths based on some onboard state detection, but we distill them into these sequences. And when we do that, we lose um, the intent and the constraints. So if you were to just look at the end product, you don't actually uh, always know why someone laid out in this time sequenced order the commands that you're sending to the spacecraft. Uh, and they're very carefully crafted in order to do exactly what uh, we'd like it to do. And once we actually uplink them and send it to the spacecraft, the monitoring that we perform is just limited to fault checking. So you'll check that am I executing this command in the context that it was meant to execute. But if it's not so, typically you just fail that sequence. It's generally just sort of a checking to make sure that uh, you're performing uh, the sequence at the intended state. Because of that, we also tend to be very conservative because we don't want to fail that check. So we build in all this margin, which is where a lot of the underutilization comes in because uh, we, we are predicting the state. Very rarely is the state on board exactly what we predict it to be, and so we have to build in all this margin. So what's the MXEC approach? So the approach is that the intent and constraints that we started with, to preserve those, and in addition to the products, you could still use your sequences if, uh, if you choose to do it that way, but to actually transmit to the, those to the spacecraft and have flight software on board that can perform checking of the constraints and uh, based on the state that you're actually monitoring on board, which is the actual state. So this is sort of the driving uh, you know, idea behind what we were trying to do um, for this, which would allow us to um, fail operational too. So what it is doing is you're still uplinking a plan. It's coordinating the activities which, is, which are in the plan based on the onboard state and the specified intent. Uh, so the software that we develop, it monitors the current state of the spacecraft as you're executing, but also takes the current state, which is the best estimate you'll have as you're executing the plan each, each instant in time, and then projecting it forward. Some of what Steve was talking about, you know, doing, uh, you can make it as simple or as complicated as you want. You can solve equations or you can just project very simple timelines that are just state dependencies. Uh, and so you know that if there's an activity you're doing now, am I still valid to execute the remainder of the plan? Because there's a critical activity that you have to do. At the end of this flyby, you still have to attain a certain attitude. Am I going to meet that or do I have to drop certain activities in the plan? So the benefits of this are you're responding to actual state, the actual state on board the spacecraft, not some predicted estimate of the state uh, that you had on the ground. You're performing these onboard constraint checking. And for our case, which was what we were trying to do, it enables this fail operational capability, uh, such as if you have a flight software reset, you come back up, you're looking at the actual state. So if the state is different, you can still monitor the constraints of the activities based on that state and determine whether an activity that you're meant to execute is valid and make decisions based on that. It also allows opportunistically taking advantage of surplus resources. What often happens is, you know, the case right now in Curiosity, we sort of have an, uh, had an anomaly recently. The remainder of the plan doesn't execute because all, ha you know, planned in as a cascading effect. But you may also, because of the margin we build in, what happens is, Oftentimes, every, everybody pads margin because nobody wants their activity to fail, uh, and uh, you may actually end early. So while well, there's time to do this extra science, uh, and so you can add that, that if you uh, had the logic on board to check against the actual state. It actually simplifies the uplink product creation and review because you now have captured the intent and constraints explicitly. So when you are looking at those products, you're not just looking at a sequence of timestamp commands or event-driven commands. You're actually looking at what the intent was, and it's easier to evaluate them with that context. And you know, it reduces, the, in the long term, it'll reduce the tactical overhead because you are sending intent and constraints and not very low-level uh, commands. You have the choice to do so if you choose to still send the low-level commands. So there's a flexible choice between the sequencing and commanding, which was something in our case we really wanted to maintain. We didn't want to just say you have to overhaul and completely use the old uh, new system. You could choose to do your sequences. The amount of gain you have will depend on how much of that intent and constraints you put in. If you just use sequencing, 
you won't get a lot of the advantage, but this allows you to slowly roll it out as you sort of develop confidence in, um, in the software. And it's, uh, so you know, I think I talked about this. So one of the important thing also is we realize that as these systems get more complicated, one of the issues we encountered, like say for the Curiosity, was there's a lot of subsystem interaction. And that results in a lot of problems for the VNV and also makes the system brittle. Uh, here, the UBIS instrument has a dependency on thermal and on GNC, but you don't want them to know about each other. So we manage them through the sequences in this brittle way. But if this piece of software, uh, through products that you can uplink from the ground, uh, you can put those dependencies as something that is changeable on a somewhat uh, more flexible scale than a flight software upload, it allows you to make them explicit without having to hard code them. So that's another advantage. So here I'll go through um, an example of uh, the very simplified example of the sort of thing they're trying to do. So here is an example where the initial scene plan is at 10, you know, I'm getting rid of all the Europa times, et cetera, just because it's simpler. We want to do, we want to have GNC attain Nader, and then at 10.15, I want to do an instrument flyby. This specific instrument, we had different instrument, and uh, we want to do a flyby request. So here, the way to look at this is, uh, this, is the, this is the GNC Nader activity, and the blue shows what is the intent plan. At this time, this is the plan to execute this activity, and at this time, this will start. So that is uh, what we're showing here. Now, the instrument flyby request in this case can be satisfied by putting the instrument in flyby mode, where you actually get the science as a high-value science return. But there's also this degraded mode, which is when the, in the flyby, you're pointing nadir and getting high-quality science. But a lot of the instrument uh, PIs we found that actually, even if the instrument is, even if the spacecraft's not pointed neither, they really don't want you to turn it off. They're like, collect any data. Any data is better than no data. So they want this degraded mode where the preference is for flyby, but then, you know, uh, if you can achieve nadir, go into the degraded mode. So that is the intent of this plan that they want to send from the ground. The state, there's an interaction with spacecraft state here. So when you uh, command to go to nadir, the spacecraft starts turning. At the end, when it's achieved nadir, it's in this nadir state. So this is onboard spacecraft state, and uh, also predicted state right now. And instrument mode here is orbital, which is uh, this particular instrument would stay in orbital mode for the entire pedal. And then when you put it in flyby mode, it's in flyby mode and collecting that higher quality science. In our, um, uh, the way we manage these is we have the concept of a constraint. It's a requirement on a state. And here, it's a requirement on a state, a resource of value at a specific time or over a time interval. And so these activities, they have requirements. For, uh, and I'll go into that a little bit more. And they have impacts. When you do a certain activity, there is a certain constraints it has for what the spacecraft state needs to be and what other activities need to have completed and also how it'll impact subsequent uh, activities. So resource for this is just a value over time. It can be data volume, energy, claimed states, anything. So you can have these uh, constraints and impacts at the start of an activity for our particular prototype. You can have them at the end of an activity or with respect relative to the, you can have any delta relative to the start and end or due rank. So you can put these constraints um, on these activities um, in this uh, manner. So now going back to how we ended up with uh, the plan here, for example, in this case, the GNC attain nadir, its post impact is after this activity has completed, the impact that it will have on spacecraft state is that the state will be nadir. And that is something you have captured in your activity. Typically, we actually capture this on the ground. We just don't send it to the spacecraft. Here, we're talking about putting it in your activity dictionary and making this available to the spacecraft. And here, you have a, a pre-constraint on the instrument flyby, which is that in order to start this activity, the spacecraft should be nadir. You're also making that available uh, to the spacecraft. Uh, it through, you know, uh, this is in your uh, plan. And then the next one, which I thought I clicked, is a maintain constraint. It'll just move in a minute. And which is that when you are executing the flyby, uh, the 
state should be NATO, and actually this should have been from flyby. This is a slightly older version, it appears. And then the impact when you are executing the flyby is that the impact of this flyby is that it's actually executing the flyby request when you're executing the flyby. It's satisfying that request. So this is how you communicate all of these constraints um, uh, to, into the plan. And you end up with this plan, which essentially satisfies those constraints. You send it up from the ground based on the assumption that at this time, all, this, all these activities would unfold like so. In this next slide, the way to look at it is the orange shows what actually executed. So the blue was meant to show what we planned, and the orange here shows what actually happened. So here we you know, uh, executed the attained nadir, the spacecraft was turning, it got into nadir. At the time it got there, at, we executed the flyby time, and here's where we are. But at this time instant, we're actually gonna encounter a reset. And the way is that currently, the nominal uh, assumption that we have is and this is still very much under development, is it'll be about three minutes to come out of the reset. So this is the instant in which the spacecraft reset, we sort of lose all our state, et cetera, and we come back at this time, and we recover the state, the non-volatile state, which, uh, which includes the state of the plan at the time. Once we uh, come back up, and, and the system fault protection is what is taking the spacecraft through the reset and bringing it back up. It needs to let the autonomous system, the onboard flight software, know that it is good to restart the plan. That is the current uh, mechanism we have. When we come back up, it's actually looking at actual spacecraft state. The predicted state was everything was going to be just fine, but now the state is actually unknown. Now, the maintained constraint, uh, which we had discussed earlier on this flyby, was that the attitude state needed to be nadir. That is now being violated. Uh, the onboard software detects that, and when it detects that their constraint is being violated, this activity is, uh, is aborted. Uh, you could choose to either do a cleanup, you have choices for what you do. We have the option available for uh, uh, the ground planners to specify something called a contingency response, which is to say, when a specific activity, so an activity completes with success or failure, and there are various types of failure. You can say, when failure of this type happens, I want you to just restart this. So in this case, the contingency response was when the flyby fails, just restart it. You specify just restart it, but because you specified the constraints on this activity previously, it's it's very easy to specify the contingency response and know that all of those constraints will still be checked on board. So that's what happens here. It says, okay, I have to restart this activity. However, it knows that the instrument flyby has a pre-constraint that it needs to be in nadir state. There are other options and permissions you can give this, um, the onboard software for this. We have these example plan modifiers. You, it can add certain activities it can delete them or it can move them, et cetera. And you can, per activity, give it permission to do that in uh, different contexts. So here, we had given it permission to add a GNC attain nadir activity if needed to repair the plan in case uh, there was a reset. So it determines that the post impact is that this activity will achieve nadir. So it goes ahead and adds that activity. However, now it discovers that the instrument flyby request, the ground had wanted to do, the blue, uh, have a request to do an instrument measurement this whole time. If I'm going to add an attain nadir here, I'm not gonna be able to start the request until here. So it also has the option to add a flyby, which was another permission it was given, this activity uh, was given. So it can um, add, an, it knows that that satisfies this request, so it goes ahead and adds this degraded flyby, which is, a flyby while the instrument is not pointed nadir. So it adds this activity to attain nadir, do the degraded flyby while it's attaining nadir, and then when it's achieved nadir to um, go ahead and put the spacecraft back. So you, this makes it such that you just specify these constraints and no matter where the reset happens, it's going to check these constraints and repair the plan uh, you know, based on that state. So for example, here's another example. The reset actually occurred fairly late here. Exactly the same constraints, you sent the same plan on board. It now says, okay, this activity failed. Now, the same thing happens. When the activity fails, the response is, 
uh, to just add that activity. So it first attempts to add that activity. However, there is not enough time to add it before it has to meet its deadline for the next constraint. So it uh, realizes I can't add it because I have to actually attain neater in order to put it in that mode. So instead, it just goes ahead and adds that degraded flyby. And so the exact same plan, depending on with the same constraints, you can end up with um, uh, getting the right behavior from the spacecraft in these cases. So that was what we were sort of the sorts of problems we were solving. So this was a prototype effort because the Europa mission is looking at what are all the ways in which they could address this. So we did this, uh, you know, uh, over the summer, over the summer, this past summer, this work. We designed and implemented a prototype version of this MXAC. So, you know, there were three of us who wrote the code for it. It's 112,000 lines or so of C code, doesn't include, you know, all the auto code, et cetera. There's lots of that. And it we designed it, even though we were doing it for the Europa prototype, we designed it for multi mission use. And there are very few dependencies on Europa flight software and the operating system. The parts of the code actually, there's, there's team shared between that and M2020, is being used on the other missions. So, one of the things is this high level sorts of software, like I think Steve was mentioning earlier too, you can put it, uh, uh, you, it's more easily portable because you, the context dependent part is actually configurable. So you can, uh, you, can, you can mature it for a mission and know that you will be able to have the benefit on other missions. We implemented multiple fail operational scenarios. So we did this reset at different times while GNC is maintaining Nader for multiple different instruments. So, you know, like I think Steve was also mentioning, uh, we, did a, uh, we, we have a simulator. We had an integrated simulation in Linux. We did a lot of that in Linux because it's fast. We could all run it any time. And then we have something called Wistacid, uh JPL, which we use in a lot of our mission, which is the workstage test environment. And so we tested on that and the Europa flight system uh, test bed, which is a RAD 750. So it runs uh, with uh, time and space partitioning, but it does not require time and space partitioning. And we simulated this reset, and it took less than a tenth of a second to resolve the plan problems after the plan reset on uh, the RAD 750. We also demonstrated this, you know, integrating with the real flight software. So a lot of the flight software for GNC thermal, all these other things, hasn't actually been developed. So we simulated a lot of that software. And, but we use the interfaces that we would use from software, so when those parts of flight software become available, the way we communicate will be no different than we do right now. We also, um, on, uh, in the Europa flight software core environment, there is this neat concept of a, a state buffer store. A lot of this is, uh, coordination is knowing what the spacecraft state is, and currently a lot of systems, it's all distributed across the various uh, flight software modules. And there's this mechanism which is to have a more coordinated uh, state buffer concept and we utilize that in this, um, in this development effort. We also demonstrated it end to end with the ground to, uh, tool prototype where we incorporated a ground tool. Uh, the, out, the ground tool generated output. We actually took that output generated from that ground tool and ran it with this prototype and executed the scenario. And I think this was just going to talk about how you would represent this in task activity dictionaries. And this is just showing an example of how in the ground tool they just said, we want to, this is just a snapshot of the tool, we would do this request. It would detect that in order to do this flyby request, you need, it needs Nader and it would automatically add a Nader so it would help the planner develop this. So I think um, just to conclude, this provides fail operational capability. Constraints are checked on board uh, for the executing plan and the remaining plan. It doesn't require special uh, cases for handling flight software reset that occur at different times. So you don't have to design a sequence that you have to check if reset occurred at this time, what happens if it occurs at another time. And it also provides the plan enhancement option where you can uh, add, move, and remove tasks if you're given permissions and adds a uh, you know, it, it, our goal was to demonstrate that it's feasible to do this in the current, um, you know, co with the current constraints of flight software in uh, the Europa mission. And uh, we demonstrated that you can work with it for the ground tools. And the lessons we learned was that a lot of the worry from the ground is that they, they feel uncomfortable that how do you validate the plans? Because the plans have all these paths and options. So I think some work needs to be done, more work, in order to make them more comfortable about 
how those plans would be validated. And also developing user-friendly interfaces to specify and manage these tasks, because you're showing these various timelines, but how does someone visualize what would happen if a reset occurs at different times so they can, as a user on the ground, still reason through it, towards them. So that's all I have. I'm not sure if you got to this level of um, design for this concept, but is the intent to restart the scheduling based on time or state knowledge that's maintained? And if so, where is that data maintained through the reset? Right, so I, both. Uh, essentially, you as a person uh, developing the activity, uh, you know, when you lay out your plan, you could, you could develop the recovery activity saying that when the if the state is X, then I want to execute this activity based purely on state. Or you can say, if the time is in this range and the state is this, I want to uh, restart this activity. I'll, you know, you'd specify that as a constraint for doing it. The state is meant, uh, so when the reset occurs, um, there is a, there's a part of the non-volatile memory in which you, we would be, we have the concept of uh, marking uh, you know, this part we actually hadn't, uh, uh, this, in this prototype we hadn't developed that part of it, but you would mark it whether it's uh, dirty or clean and each, each state transition, so when you come back up you'd know what part of the state you had written out and what part of it was unknown because you were in the process of writing it and based on that you would take the action. So exec comes back up, it recovers all of the state of the plan that uh, existed at the time, but the state of the spacecraft is queried from the various providers of that state. Okay, I'm gonna request that if you have additional questions, contact me okay. outside. Thank you very much.